Hello, it's steaming hot here in the UK this week, which is good because this week's podcast guest is Hot Property. Way back in episode 13 of On The Ledge podcast last year, I interviewed the legend that is Mr. James Wong. He is the guy who has had 125,000 likes on a single Twitter post about a nanopond that he made in his flat in London. This guy is a one-man houseplant revolution, and I was absolutely delighted when he invited me to his flat for a personal tour of all the projects he's been working on. And I'm lucky enough to be sharing those tips and tricks with you this week. Now, if the idea of that doesn't get you hot under the collar, I don't know what will. I'm guessing that I'm going to get a fair few new listeners to the podcast once this goes viral. So if you're new to On The Ledge podcast, hello, I'm Jane Perrone, your host. I've been growing houseplants since I was a little kid, but I'm always finding there's more to learn. And that's what I love about doing this podcast, because my listeners and I go on this incredible journey of learning about our houseplants. If this is the first episode you've listened to, I'd advise you to go back and browse through the back catalogue. There's loads of gems in there, including an interview with the legendary gardener Alice Fowler, a whole episode on watering, another one on tips for buying houseplants and loads more. I'll put links to some of my highlights in the show notes at janeperone.com, so do check it out. And of course, those of you who've been here since the start or joined somewhere along the way, of course, greetings to you too. You wouldn't miss this episode, would you? Well, it's nearly time to crack on with our interview with James Wong, but just a couple of teeny housekeeping bits of business to clear up first. Welcome to this week's new Patreon subscribers, Aditya and June. You are both now legends. Well done. And you'll be joining the ranks of those who will be able to get extra Mr. Wong. I'll be putting the vast majority of my interview with James here on the main podcast for everyone to listen to for free. But I like to offer a little extra something for those of you who are pledged to give five bucks or more. And for these people... There's an episode of An Extra Leaf available now. Extra Leaf number nine contains an interview with James in his bedroom. Yes, we look at James's bedroom plants and his incredible new high-tech terrarium slash aquarium. Terrarium, aquarium, that's hard to say. Um, And it's a great extra. So if you really are a Wong fan, then it's time to sign up for Patreon with On The Ledge. You can do that by visiting patreon.com forward slash on the ledge or just visit my show notes at janeperone.com for full details. And speaking of show notes, I strongly recommend that you pull up the show notes for this episode number 55 on your phone or your laptop or wherever you're listening while you're listening to the show because there are loads and loads of tips, tricks, plant names, websites, etc. that are listed by me and Jane's in this episode and it's the best way of finding out exactly where to go for all the stuff that James is talking about from aquarium glue to concrete planters to teeny tiny aquarium plants. So do check out the show notes while you listen or afterwards and if there's anything that I've missed out just drop me a line you know the address on the ledge podcast at gmail.com or even easier leave a comment on the website I do read all of these and will respond. So without any further ado, let's get on with it. And just to say, the other voice that you'll hear in this chat is Rob Stakovitz, who is a friend of James's. He's a London-based garden designer, horticulturist and general plant whiz kid. So it's great to have his input too. I apologise in advance if I sound a bit like a breathless fangirl in some of these moments, but I have to say it was a very exciting visit. And you know me, I just couldn't contain myself so apologies about that but I hope you enjoy this chat. I've broken the interview up into chunks because there's quite a lot of it and I want to give you a pause for breath in between. So the first section is James talking about his coffee table terrarium and also the teeny tiny terrariums that he has made. I'm here with James and and Rob. Rob I'm not even going to dare pronounce your last name. Is it Stack? 
I'm going to say Stakovitz. Is that yeah, anything close? It's like, it oh, that's great. I'm here in James's bijou and compact, but very green flat. I this Having seen a lot of this on uh, social media, this is not a surprise that your living space is like this, but it is nice that it lives up to my expectations. Because sometimes on Instagram and Twitter, things can be made to look amazing and then when you see them in real life it's a bit disappointing but actually no i can oh, confirm good. that james wong is not making this all up he does actually he has actually living the life of somebody who loves plants i think the problem is um with instagram is you can very selectively edit what you want to show whereas in my exactly. flat like you've if you've seen i've got a picture on instagram of one wall and a picture of the other and that's the everything i have <laughs> i can't selectively pick anything there's not space for it well, maybe we should start. How, how long has it been like? Has it always been like this? Or have you suddenly gone for an interior interior makeover? No. So I started uh, really going crazy with houseplants beginning of last year. So I've always loved houseplants. Was it because you were listening to On The Ledge podcast? I think it must have been. <laughs> <laughs> it was no, actually we, we before know it I discovered back. it. We know and it I... goes back further than that because, yeah. of course, we both, as we discussed in uh, the episode where we talked before, a uh, houseplant expert has been... A lifelong love uh, that particular book um so a year and a bit a year and a year and a half yeah i think well for me the, the tricky thing is i have, it's a rented flat and i have lived in lots of rented flats but for never more than like a year or two and i've always had some house plans but i've never really like had very many and i i just always thought i'd be moving and i suddenly realized well I, you know the goal was i'd always i'd eventually move and buy somewhere and i suddenly realized well i've been living here for five years and if you look at property prices anywhere in London, which is where I call home, there's just, there's, I'd have to quadruple my income to buy something. Um, so I suddenly realized, actually, you know, it's, it's not happening. Um, I might as well just, you know, I could be here another five years. So just go for it. Um, you have to sort of make the most of what you've got yeah. as well, because where I live, it's rented as well. And I just thought... You know, rather than look out on an ugly front garden, I've really sort of focused a bit on it and, you know, put a little bit of money in, not huge amounts, but it just, I think, repays so much more joy than if you just have nothing. Totally. Mm. I think this is what you've got to do. You've got to make the best of what you've got. And the first thing that I'm, in fact, my recorder is resting on this particular feature, which is your coffee table, glass-topped coffee table. And this is just awesome because it's a fairly, I mean, it's a, not being rude about it, but it's a fairly bog standard coffee table, but with a glass top inlaid. But underneath, tell me about what's underneath this yeah. glass. Well, so it, yeah, it is exactly like it's a, I, I think it's a boring 1980s timber coffee table uh, that I got in a charity shop down the road. Um, and it's, it has this magazine rack underneath, as a lot of glass coffee tables have. And I was just forever having to dust the magazine rack. <laughs> And I was getting sick of it because it's like it's quite a small flat to get in there and dust stuff. And I was making terrariums and I had loads of plants on the top of my table. And I suddenly went, hang on a second. This is just one big old terrarium. And I can fit much more plants underneath this than I can on top. Um, so I, uh, all I needed was to figure out a way to actually get a tray that's big enough um, and rest it on the magazine rack. Uh, I looked up online and I was looking at like catering trays and all kinds of different websites. And I found that there's a, a thing called a dog cage tray, which is basically the tray that goes on the bottom of a dog, a dog cage. It's only, I think it's two centimeters high, um, which is plenty of grow root if you're picking the right plant species with very shallow roots. So I put it on top. I filled it with a 50-50 mix of regular compost and perlite, so, so it's not too heavy because it's resting on a glass shelf. Uh, and I didn't want to break that. <laughs> and then um, I just shoved some plants in it. And I didn't think it would work because it's quite far away from the window. And it's a double layer of glass. You have the glass in the window and the glass on the table. Um, but amazingly, and I thought I'd have to change it loads. I haven't really done anything to it. I haven't added any plants. Um, I've got some jesnerias in there, some pileas, uh, a bit of moss and some driftwood and stuff. And it's kind of been quite happy. It looks really great. Um, I mean, I can't believe that that tray is so shallow, really. That's not de deep at all. And obviously, there's no drainage, so you have got to be a little bit careful with watering. Mm. But How do you water that? Okay, so I, I have glass at the top here, and I okay. got rid of that because it was just heavy and a pain to lift up to water every time. And I replaced it. There's a website you can go to buy custom-cut plastic. 
So oh, I just this got is the all the secret. This is yeah. all the secrets being revealed, yeah. and I, I love that. So that's obviously so you can lift that like out. That. Okay, yeah. Um, so it takes like a second to pop out, um, and then I just water it with a watering can. Um, and I thought I'd have to be spraying this. So Rob was here for my journey. He was like, "Okay, what you need to do is you need to slide the table towards the window <laughs> <laughs> every couple of days." And I was like, "Yeah," and I'm going to have to get it misted and everything. And, well, I've just been too lazy to do any of that. And it's stayed alive. Um, I think the thing is, it's about species choice, right? So everything I've picked here grows on rocky faces uh, or as epiphytes. So naturally, they're not going to be dealing with much soil space. And naturally, they are quite resistant to drying out. In fact, things like uh, Apicia that I have here, the Gesneriad, um, the biggest problem that a lot of people have with it is waterlogging. And in this area, because it has so little soil, it does get flooded when I water it because I put two or three can, watering cans of water on this uh, once a week, and then it completely dries out. So because there's so little soil media, by the next week it's bone dry, and they, they prefer that than, than constant moisture. Yeah, I guess that's how they're, how they're living in the wild. They're, they're, they're flooded, and then, then it's yeah. drought, and then the next... You know, they're getting a pretty realistic uh, environment there. It does look really great, I have to say. I'm just going to have to stand up to fully appreciate it. Uh, you've also got satin, satin pothos in there, which you didn't mention. Oh, that yes. I love nice. that. And uh, the old, um, well, there's a million and one names for this pile there, isn't it? Glauca, aquamarine, whatever you like to call it. But that's, that's a it. sweet little thing. And um, the, the peleonias, which I can't believe the, we were just saying before we started that the size of these peleonia leaves is... I don't know Crazy. how it does. They call it a watermelon plant. So I got them from a, a website. It's very. It's one of those plants that I grew up with. It was super common in the eighties, and now no one has it. Yeah, so I got that's it from true. a website that deals with vivariums. Yeah, um, this is a this is this is gold. Yeah, James, this is what I've been saying to people. Just go to these these vivarium um, shops, and the range of plants is so much. And better, they're like a separate universe like a separate dimension so because yeah. they're they're not gardening and they're not in the gardening world they're just creating set backdrops for animals so like you know dart frogs and salamanders and all that kind of it's thing it's like a parallel world yeah so they don't seem to talk to the rest of the horticulturists no. and you have all this amazing stuff from the 80s yeah. which no one has anymore yeah um, that's that is a really good piece of advice they, i've they done do it lots too. of bromeliads and things like that mm. so you, you just can't get those in you know garden centres, nurseries. If you go to the average British garden centre, you'll see a sea of Phalaenopsis orchids and Kentia palms. And that's why people have not been getting into houseplants for years. You know, one of the reasons why I wasn't into houseplants, even though I grew up with them and kind of obsessed with them, um, was partially the fact that I thought I would move, but partially... I was never tempted when I went to any garden centres. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I I dissed peace lilies before, but again, yeah. I'm just... I, I can't get excited about peace lily. I just, although I did go to somebody's house when I was on my trip to Dorset recently, yeah. and I saw the biggest peace lily. It was in a very nice house, and it was the biggest peace lily I've ever seen. It was, it was giant enormous, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which would, did look pretty cool. But, but other that's than the that, thing; they never sell that cultivar. They sell yeah. the same boring <laughs> ass one that I've seen five thousand times. Yeah, but, you know, Spice Pearl are super diverse, and there are loads of amazing ones. Yeah. But although Dutch nurseries do produce them, British yeah. garden centres just never buy them. So it's very difficult. I mean, it's really easy for me to get excited when I go to Holland and see what they produce with Spatterfilm, but very difficult until really recently. And I think it's, you know, when I discovered like all the cool East End indie garden centers like N1, like Conservatory Archives, uh, and also the fact that I realized online you can get weird stuff through eBay. Yeah, it's and that's when I got crazy. Uh, thanks to the internet yeah. as well, really. And I think that's a nice thing if you are if you do get into plants that you can kind of start this kind of treasure hunt around the internet looking mm. for stuff that you're interested in. And sometimes that can end in a disaster when you order some seeds off eBay which turn out to be like, you know, mustard yes. seeds or something. It's like, oh this James, you know, so, this that. doesn't look no. like my layer peperomioides seed. This looks like a <laughs> mustard or whatever, you know. Or it looks fine, but it never germinates. Yeah, I spent so much money on begonia seed. Like right. three or four times trying to get hold of really w- rare cultivars and just nothing comes up. Um, yeah, so depressing. That's really... But, but you, know, that's you do strike gold sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that's... It's very exciting when something turns up at your door and... Well, I after last week's episode talking to the, the, uh, the Gesneriad Society, I did get with my Gesneriad Society membership <laughs> a little sachet of Gesneriad seed, including some syringes and things. So I'm going to be sowing that. I've got the technique now from Dale from last week's episode. 
So I'm very excited about that. I might because... have to become a member. If this is the only way I'm oh. going to get hold of weird stuff, I'll yeah, <laughs> do no, it with every society. Yeah, it's, it's really worth joining if you're into Gizneriads, which, uh, which I and I think believe you are too. So that, that, that's, there, is, there are these journeys you end up going on when you're into houseplants, which is great. Let's look at what else should we look at. This isn't uh, what, what do we want to show me next, James? I thought it would be quite nice, uh, just to point out that the coffee table's the biggest feature, probably in the room. Yeah, uh, and yeah, yeah. I yeah. think it would be cool to get oh, to the yeah. smallest. Oh, oh yeah, so Rob, you, you've got a good idea. I'm just gonna shift ourselves over right. here and look at this. Oh man, this is what I really want. This is what my kids would go nuts for. Well, they can have one. It's, they're not I difficult to create. I need to, to do this. And oh, they are awesome as well. So, I've got <laughs> lots of different If only this was video, table. but I'm looking at these tiny, tiny... How the heck did you That's make this? That's about the this? size of a light bulb, isn't it? Tell me about the, these tiny terrariums containing little gems. Okay, plants. so one of the, the there were two tricky things I found with terrariums. Um, one of them ones is actually getting a good vessel to, uh, in the first place. And they always seem to be open-sided. And the, the whole point of a terrarium is you can grow things that are normally impossible to grow because they trap um, humidity. So if they're open-sided, it's basically just a fancy pot uh, that's difficult to water because it doesn't have drainage holes. So I'm looking for one that's almost completely sealed or completely sealed. And I found these in a Japanese store on Regent Street. But, like, you know, I think each one was six to ten quid, so super affordable. And they're vases. They're miniature vases. Uh, but because they're vases, they're closed up at the top, are almost entirely sealed. And I thought, rather than putting something sticking at the top, could you create something inside? So one of the problems with the vessels, and the other problem I always have, is actually finding terrarium plants that are small enough for terrariums. Mm. Mm. So normally you have a, a big plant, like an adult-sized big plant, and they sell you a juvenile to put in a terrarium. The second that puts on two leaves, yeah. it's too big. Yeah. Um, and I discovered in the world of aquascaping, there are lots and lots of plants that are specifically selected to be really small so they fit inside aquariums. So there's a, a trend for a thing called nano aquariums where they're tiny, like a 20, 30 centimeter cube. Um, so I thought in that extremely high humidity, these aquarium plants should survive fine. So these are all aquarium plants. These are all normally submerged aquatic plants um, that I've just shoved on the inside with a little bit of moss. Um, I tend to use aquarium substrate when planting mm -hmm. up terrariums as well because uh, normal compost a it breaks down and b it dirty so you get dust and on the on the glass itself this you can kind of keep them clear um, and you can even grow them like i'm not so sure this experiment's going to work out but i've discovered in with terrarium plants you can actually glue them to things so i have a branch in the center there i've got to look at this close up yeah those it's like a doll's house plant yeah whatever that, that is what is that tiny plant so there are two there that one of them is anubius pangolino uh, which is a small aroid with uh, dark, glossy leaves. And the other one is a fern called Bulbetis. Um, and in the aquascaping industry, you can buy plants that are tiny, uh, created by micropropagation, and you just glue them to things. So I've been gluing them to things in my aquarium and treating them as epiphytes underwater. And I thought, well, let's see if I can treat them as epiphytes outside of the water. And so far, like... So, yeah, they've worked. And yeah. this is something that no one ever tells you you could do. Um, I've had a lot of failures, but this one seems to it's, be working. It's almost like those uh, ships in the bottle. I don't, yeah. how, I don't know how you've done these, James. It's almost like you've like shrunk yourself and gone in there. <laughs> I want to live inside one of them. I want to see the BBC do, like, with special effects, yeah. to actually yeah. have James yeah. inside one of these bottles. Yeah. That well, would be so cool. It's not, like, so all of these, unlike a ship, Plants fold very easily, so mm. all of them could be, you know, like a Christmas tree is folded up and, and tied around it. Uh, I just have a pair of um, long tweezers that I use for aquariums, so you can buy them in aquarium shops. Um, and I've just stubbed everything inside there. I'm not one for like the whole, you know, the, the carboys that they used to have in the 70s, mm. and they used mm. to be like bamboo tools to like yeah. shove everything in. I find that really stressful looking. These, because <laughs> they're so small, and you only put two or three plants in, it's not that much of a stress, but the goal is that it looks like a whole universe, like in a small shape. And you've um, got, is, is this moss that you've got covering the the, sub, the rest of the substrate? Yeah, so that, there is a there are, it's a mixture of regular moss. I got that from a uh, garage roof. <laughs> nice. uh, and also you can buy aquatic moss for aquariums. Um, so I've just kind of shoved some of that in there as well. But I think that this is a big thing. If, when people, like I was in a garden centre yesterday, and there was a guy in there saying he wants to create like mini ecosystems under glass. 
And I was just looking at what he had to pick from. And I really wanted to go up to him and say, no, <laughs> just don't pick anything here. In like two weeks, it'll be too big. Go to an aquarium shop and buy some uh, micro propagated stuff. That is like a revelation to me because you're so right. That's what happens. You buy like a tiny little parlor palm or something, for, you know, sold as a terrarium plant or a little a little fern. But as you say, it's not going to last very long and that's the disappointment that's where people go wrong with terrariums in that six months later it's like oh it's outgrown it and i'm going to start all over again well i hope you enjoyed that that's just the first segment plenty more to come next we'll be talking about the teeny tiny aquarium that sits on james's dining table which also doubles up as his writing desk oh and don't forget to have a look at my houseplant buying guides for the US and the UK. I've been adding in some of the sources that James suggests for buying aquarium and terrarium plants so do go and take a look at those. I'll include them in the show notes. And now on with the chat. This is probably my fate. Well, I haven't really looked over there yet. Oh. On the other side of the other wall. But this um, aquarium tank on your table is my favourite thing. Oh, it's just, I'm just totally having a fangirl moment here about this. Oh. Is this something you saw somewhere and thought, I want to emulate that? Or is this completely out of your own head? Is this... Um, or yeah, a combination? I, this, is the, this is the tricky thing, yeah. right? So I, I would like to say that I see stuff in garden land and feel inspired by it and then do it. And I don't... I'm not intentionally sounding egotistical, but I just don't. <laughs> Uh, the reason why I try and do different things is because I don't feel inspired by what I see. Um, so I really, really wanted to create a tank, and I've always had you know tanks as a kid. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Singapore, like one of the big national industries was tropical fish and tropical plant creation for the worldwide market. So wherever you'd buy tropical fish in the 80s, that's where it comes from. Um, so our school trips to, you know, I guess in the UK it might be a farm or something. The closest thing we had to farms was, you know, fish farms. So I used to go to those as a kid and I always had them. And I never had them in the UK because I always thought that you would need really tricky tech. Um, in, in Asia, you just have fill a vessel with water and put it outside and put some fish in it. And in the UK, I thought you'd need, you know, heaters. I thought you'd need like fancy UV lights and everything. Um, and I thought, well... I'm going to experiment with this because I, I was in Ikea and I noticed that they had grow lights. And once upon a time, grow lights used to be super hot, super heavy and, you know, ridiculously expensive both to buy and run. And I saw one for like 20 quid and I thought, oh, and you could just some of them you could just screw into like a regular lamp. And I thought, well, with this application, you could do anything like you could, you know, you could grow basil if you wanted to. But you could also you know, have an amazing aquarium. So I, uh, I got the lamp from Ikea, uh, I filled the tank with water, and I thought, well, the rest of the functions, you know, could be taking care of the plants. The plants will clean everything. Um, my flat is, the one thing, as you may notice about my flat, is it's not only small, it's unbelievably hot. It's unbelievably humid just from the building. I'm on the, one of the top floors, and all the heat comes up here. So I thought I wouldn't even need heating. So I filled it up, put some plants in it, and, um, well, that's it. <laughs> And um, you've got some little guys swimming around in here. Yep. Yeah. So I have a... These are called Endler Guppies. Um, I originally didn't have any fish in there because I'm only interested in plants. Um, and I also thought that, you know, as an experiment, I didn't know if it was going to fail. Um, I didn't want it to fail if I had fish in it because, just you know, it's not a, not a great idea. So I let it run for a good three months um, and then suddenly realized it was all fine. So I have some fish in there, and I also have some freshwater shrimp that are running around. You might see one popping out uh, here and there. Oh, there's one right there. Yep, um, I can see. And yeah. they both help clean up the algae. Um, I do feed them as well, um, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week. Um, but that's about it. I think one of the other things... So it's been a, a series of stages. I started realizing that not only did you not need all this tech, um, at least in a warm flat, I also thought, well... What about if you have plants coming inside of the water and outside of the water? Like, because, you know, you could have, if this is a pond, you would have plants that come out. So I had some driftwood in there, and I realized that the driftwood was being kept wet. So the bits of the driftwood that were sticking out of the water were still wet. Could I get moss to grow on that? So I got some moss, and I just used some fishing line to, like, wire it on, and that stayed on there. And then I thought, okay, I've done that. How about some plants? 
Um, so I've got some of the aquatic plants that are in and outside of the water. I've also got um, a range of different nepenthes, the pitcher plants, uh, and they're all watered just by the wick effect. So they water themselves by drawing up water from the tank below. Um, the one thing I did see online that I thought was really interesting uh, was when I was buying all of this stuff, so I buy this all online, um, was there's this stuff called aquarium glue. And I was like, oh, that must be for making an aquarium, if you're making one from scratch and gluing pieces of glass together. It's not. It's super glue that glues stuff together underwater and instantly and is safe for fish. I think it may just be normal super glue <laughs> that's been cleverly <laughs> rebranded, but I saw it and I was like, oh. Um, and then I realized that, so you have, I don't have any plants growing in the gravel on the bottom of the, uh, the, the tank. I did when I started. Now I've just glued it all to the wood. So I literally buy each individual small plant, take off all of the, the rock wool that it's grown in, and super glue it to the wood. Um, so it's kind of like an underwater tree, I guess, with epiphytes growing on it, tree branch. Um, and yeah, that's the kind of look I Jane, try and recreate. Jane, I think you and I are both just entranced and mesmerized oh, I am, by I am it. sitting here totally it's mesmerized. It's so relaxing oh, to look at, isn't I it? Want, <laughs> it's my, my boring banging on about it. <laughs> well, I, I, no, I'm absolutely mesmerized by it. And I can, I have to say, I've always loved looking at fish tank and tanks and, and had, had fish tanks as a child and as an adult. Um, and I just think it's magical to watch my questions as somebody who has had fish tanks before mm. are though algae mm -hmm. how much algae removal are you doing so I do have you, you know this is some on the glass there yeah. which I haven't wiped off so the only maintenance I do on the tank well the only maintenance I have to do on the tank is I have a I bought a smoker's toothbrush because I was realising that like all the stuff I was trying to clean stuff off with just wasn't working. I have a blade uh, that you can buy in an aquarium shop on the, on the long end of it and that wasn't cleaning. So I thought oh, what I need to get in all these little ticky corners is a toothbrush mm -hmm. and I read like an industrial strength super hard one and um, I got a, a smoker's toothbrush which I don't know how anyone can brush their teeth with this because it's like rock hard bristles wow. but it's amazing at cleaning the glass. So I do that, and I do a water change once a week. So I take mm -hmm. out maybe a mug or two of water, and then I top it back up. And what that does is it reduces um, a buildup. If there's a buildup of nitrates in there, mm -hmm. it helps reduce some of that. But I don't have... Well, I mean, at least in the tanks that I have with enough plants, they should be taking up most of the work for the filtering. If the flat's warm, it won't need heating. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing it relies on is light. I mean, with light and water, plants will do a lot of that cleaning themselves. So you've just got this uh, grow light over it, yeah. uh, which presumably you just have that on when you get up in the morning. And... I have them on a the timer. Okay. Uh, so so uh, I, I originally only put them on a timer because I was going on holiday uh, and I needed to make sure that my plants would survive. Um, but yeah, I would not, like before that, I was just, when I got up in the morning, turn it on and when I went back to, to bed, turn it, uh, turn it off every night. Um, but I do end up... Because I work from home a lot, and I, you know, one of the biggest jobs I do is writing, and I write at my dining table, I do end up faffing with it, though. So I'm like forever, like, oh, maybe I need to like glue that in a different place or move that here or whatever. So I do spend a lot of time on it, but that's just... I would just, never get any work done. That's, I would yeah. seriously never get any... I'd just be like staring at that all day. Well, like this a, is the thing. I want to have a garden that I can potter in. And I can't afford one, <laughs> so I'm going to potter in my tank. <laughs> so Perhaps we should have some kind of exchange program. You can come yes. and potter in my garden. I'll come and sit and watch your your tank because uh, yeah, I've got. Well, actually, the things that need to be to be done in my garden are not pottering. They're more like smashing down bits of bamboo. And things. It's not really very relaxing. This is the thing that I think is wonderful um, about house plants. Is I, I've been doing this throughout January and February when mm. it was just cold and miserable outside and I would love to be outside looking at nature and it's just uncomfortable uh, for a fair weather gardener like me. <laughs> it's also very expensive because you're doing everything on a bigger scale. Uh, it's also a lot of time. You know, if you have, I don't have a disability, but if you had a disability in any way, you know, if you want to garden on a big scale, it's very tricky. But if you're doing tanks, and I think one of the important thing about like all of the things I do is they're all miniaturized. So the, my goal with them is to create something that looks like a full landscape. So they are quite high maintenance in general because I've miniaturized everything. Instead of one plant in this tank, I've probably got over a hundred small little baby ones dotted around. Um, it takes me more time to do. 
And it means I, I, can, I can feel like I have a huge landscape, even if it's, I mean, it's not that much bigger than a shoebox, is it? Probably like two shoeboxes stuck together. Yeah, yeah, um, no, it is, it is tiny. Let's get down to brass tacks, though, with this. Yeah. What, tell us, you've got, so you've got the Nepenthes, you've got a Venus flytrap there. Yeah. You've got, um, what are the things floating on the top and what's below? So I had to learn all of this stuff from scratch because all the, the plants that are available in aquascaping are almost completely different now to when I was doing this as a kid. Um, uh, and like again totally different from regular horticulture so the thing I like the most in here is a Busa phalandra uh, I love the family Aracy they're the Aroid family so I've got some what they call Busa phalandras and they're like a tiny mm, what would you what is it like it's a little bit like a tiny peace lily uh, that are dotted around and th these are from Borneo and they grow on seasonally flooded uh, riverbanks for example and plains so they can grow both inside and outside the water as long as they have high humidity so I've planted some inside and then some kind of on the, the wood, wood outside I say planted I mean super glued um, I've also got <laughs> loving the yeah. glue idea I just think that's yeah. so cool there, there's some in flower you see the flowers yeah. they look like um, almost like a zandadeshi a calla yeah. lily uh, I think there's one of the few underwater plants that you can grow that has flowers. So I, I, I think they're just really simple and beautiful. Um, this, I've got some Anubias, which is relatively closely related. It's like the African counterpart uh, to, that fill, fulfills the same ecological niche. It's also a uh, peace lily look-alike and also in the same family. Uh, what else have I got? I've got Pogostenum, the, these lime green star-shaped plants. Um, these are all from micropropagation which means you can get them in tiny sizes and then play so around with them. They're so cute. They're so cute um, and tiny. It's like, a doll, it's like a doll's house plant. I've said that before, but, but They really don't get bigger. Is. That's the that, amazing that thing. The, and, and so that, although you say it's high maintenance, but at least you're not going to have to totally redo that every six months because everything's got too big. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's essentially, it could be low maintenance in mm. the sense that I just would do the water change and then clean the glass once a week. Mm, mm. But... And that would take me, what, 15 minutes to do? Um, however, I am constantly thinking, oh, you know what, I think we need another wood, piece of wood here, or maybe I need to add some more plants on here. Um, I've got some ferns, I've got a uh, Bulbetis again, which is the same one. They're basically all the same plants I've yeah, used they, in they these are. tiny That's terraria. True. That's true. Um, but there's not that many species there. There's probably five and what's, different species. What's this floating in the top here? Uh, water lettuce. Oh, There's a dwarf form of water lettuce. Mm -hmm. Not the massive one that can be quite invasive mm -hmm. in tropical countries. It's a dwarf form and it's only available again in, in aquascaping. It's just so cool. I could just sit here all night and look at this. I'm, I'm so glad you overwhelmed. Like it. I'm overwhelmed with the brilliance of it and I'm going to have my son is going to go nuts when he sees that. Well, He's going to go, oh, mum, you've got to make that for me right now. So you can buy, a, you can buy tanks now that are literally... Yeah. I think 20 centimetres by 30 centimetres. And let's, so that, let's name some names here. Who yeah. are the good suppliers for this stuff if, you're, if you happen to be in the UK? I'm uh, not, yeah. In case one ever wants to do this, obviously I'm saying this totally selfishly. I think, well, I think there are only two, uh, two, two okay. that I can find. Um, so I really like aquariumgardens.co.uk and there's also a website called proshrimp.co.uk uh, and both of those are good sources for really, really small tanks. Um, you can both buy really small plants online um, with them. Uh, and... If you have a grow lamp, if you, I mean, if you can buy an eight quid IKEA lamp, which is what I have, a desk lamp, uh, you can buy the bulb that fits in it, and you can buy, and a good place to buy them is charity shops. Uh, I've seen lots of tanks in charity shops. Mm. Um, you could do that all for 50 quid max, uh, wow. including the plants. And it can be as small as a bedside table. I mean, I used to have one on my bedside table until I got a bigger one. <laughs> Oh, I love that. And I would definitely have fish in it because I, I love the, the fish uh, angle on that. I know not everyone's into that, but I just think it's, it's so, they're so fun to watch. I mean, you can totally, there are some hardy fish, of course, that you mm. could use as well. If you're flat, if you know you have a cold environment, you can't keep that water temperature good. So I, I tested this for months to yeah. make sure that water temperature didn't fall ever, uh -huh. ever below 24 degrees. But there are, I think there's something called a white tip mountain minnow, which is, completely hardy so you could white have clouds. that white, white cloud clouds. that's it I'm yeah. mixing it with right, white tip reef shark yes yeah <laughs> you don't want to thing. <laughs> white cloud um, mountain minnow that rings yeah. a bell from my so they look a place. little bit like um, a, a guppy they look yeah. tropical but they're from China and totally hardy okay well this is um, so this was one of your first this uh, was the first one yeah. yeah so I've got two three more that I could show you yeah let's go yeah. let's go and have a look let's go and have a look this is this is uh, 
As if we need more of these, more okay. temptation for me to... So, oh, this is so cool. One of the things that I, if you have very few, very little space, I first started with a coffee table, yeah. then I have a dining table, and then the other thing is this horrible laminate um, 1980s bookshelf that's built in and has come with my flat. Uh, but takes up a lot of space, um, and I just had to get rid of some books. So this had, there was a shelf here. I took that shelf out. Um, I've sa saved it so I can replace it when I move house because it's not my house. Um, and I put a tank in what the space, and in the backdrop where the second shelf was above it, I have a large piece of plastic, and so that plastic I've glued. Um, what's it called? Uh, a, um, capillary matting. Uh, it's an mm -hmm. absorbent synthetic material, and so the capillary matting wicks up the water that's in the tank and is kept constantly wet. So all I did to that was I, I tied some moss on, like a big sheets of moss that I pulled off a garage roof, and I tied it on using fishing line, and into that moss I pinned using floristry pins a few plants. You can actually see some of the pins here, if I move yeah, the leaves yeah. out of the way. Got you, yeah. Um, and it's a, the, it's a living wall although only 30 centimetres high, uh, and um, a tank at the same time. Um, and you've got another fish in there. I've got just one in this one. I've got a Siamese fighting fish. I can keep the water level at the right temperature for him, so he's dotting around. Um, they're territorial, so only one. Only one, yeah. Um, and oh, wow. Again, the water is kept clean just by me doing a water change once a week. Uh, the living wall is kept watered just by the wick effect. I've certainly seen ones online with all these fancy pumps mm. that cost a fortune, and I'm like, it's only 30 centimetres. I you guess that's the thing. The, towel in there, would the small scale up. is allowing it to, uh, to work brilliantly. Oh, it's... Um, it, and right we've got a light under there, an LED light oh, yeah, under so there, got, or two under there. So, I, I, this is lit, of course. So I found, as I said, these lamps in Ikea, which were super cheap. Um, I've st stuck two of them in there. Mm -hmm. And then I guess on, the only other thing to say is on either side of this, uh, from the same website that I think it's called Simply Plastics, so where you can get plastic cut to size, I stuck... I got some... Um, mirror acrylic, acrylic cut to size and I stuck on on both sides so in this I did this in the middle of February and I'm really miserable in winter as I'm sure Rob can <laughs> <laughs> confirm if you no, stick I'm your also miserable in winter yeah okay, so what a miserable. great winter project though yeah. yeah so you can stick your head in and think like you're in Borneo because yeah. on each side the mirrors reflect it so it I kind of feels infinite it's really down to the uh, fact that Ikea does these uh, sort of really cheap uh, grow lights that and they don't get has, too hot and they don't get too hot well that's the LED yeah. so you, you can feel yeah, warm I'm just putting my hand under there and, but, but it's not if this I mean, was a regular grow light you'd be burning if yeah it's only like on. I'm putting my hand like a centimetre underneath yeah, and it's yeah. slightly warm so, so it's once not... upon a time these lights would have been massive they mm, would have hung down here mm. I couldn't have fitted in this bookcase they would have also been a fire risk because they would have burnt the wood above it yeah. um, and they just would have I'd be spending so much money on the electricity these take up I think one percent of an old grow uh, an old grow light um so it's that technological change that means you could do it um what else I've got these kind of fake liana tree branches that I've dotted through I've tried to make it look kind of jungly um these are from aquascaping again uh they're azalea roots oh um, okay who knew like a garden azalea has a really like liana like root so yeah. I've just kind of stapled some of those in place and then uh, again more gluing for the epiphyte like jungly look. Uh, I've taken lots of these micropropagator plants and then glued them. You can actually see some of the glue, which I haven't hidden very well. These white flecks here. I glued them all in place. We wouldn't have noticed if you hadn't pointed them yeah, out. Yeah, true. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that spin around James Wong's apartment. But do you want to know the best news of all? Yep, there's more. We did such a long interview, I was there for about three hours in total, that I've decided to bring you more from James Wong next week. I've got about another 20 to 25 minutes of chat to bring you, in addition to the Patreon interview that you'll find on An Extra Leaf number nine if you're a Patreon subscriber. So that's great news, eh? 
come back next Friday for more from James Wong. He'll be talking about how he grows houseplants grouped together in window boxes to save time and effort and to make his plants happier. He'll be discussing his other tanks. Yes, he has more tanks. And of course, his famous nano pond. Do come back next week for that. In the meantime, it's time for question of the week. So this week's question came up in Houseplant Hour, which is an hour-long Twitter chat that I curate fortnightly. And the next one is happening on July the 10th at 9pm British summertime. If you wish to join me, I'd love to have you along. Just look for the hashtag Houseplant Hour. And indeed, there's also a Houseplant Hour account. The question came from Fancy Tits, who wanted to know how to look after her Albuca spiralis frizzle sizzle. Now, this plant does indeed frizzle. It has corkshoot. I can't say the word corkscrew. It has corkscrew leaves and very beautiful greeny yellow flowers. It is a succulent, but it confuses us a little bit because Albuca spiralis is generally a summer dormant plant. So in the wintertime is when it would be doing its thing. The only trouble is, is that for most of us or many of us who live in climates like the UK and parts of the US, wintertime isn't the best for getting the most out of summer dormant succulents because our days just aren't long or warm enough. The good thing about this cultivar frizzle sizzle, according to an excellent blog post I was reading recently by friend of the show, laid back gardener Larry Hodgson I'll put a link in my show notes is that frizzle sizzle has had some of that summer dormancy bred out of it so this one is a good choice if you want a plant that isn't going to give you too much trouble so just treat it like a succulent full sun only water it when it dries out you can keep it outside in the summer but do bring it in before frost threaten Now, it's worth noting that this plant like many other cacti and succulents doesn't need much feeding either And the other piece of good news is that it produces a lot of offsets like many other succulents. So you should be able to pot some of those up and pass them on to friends as easy as that. Let me know how you get on with that plant, Fancy Tits. I'd like to hear more about how it's doing. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line on the ledge podcast at (laughs) gmail.com. that wraps up this week's show thanks so much to my guests james wong and rob stackovitz you'll find james on twitter as at botany geek and rob stackovitz is at rs underscore mci hort find that and all the links from today's show in my show notes at janeperone.com looking forward already to next week james wong part two if you've been inspired by any of james's projects i'd love to see what you create do show me on Twitter or join our Facebook group, Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge. Look forward to seeing you there. Take care. Bye. The music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gukana by Samuel Corwin, Plantation by Jason Shaw, and O Mallory by Josh Woodward. All licensed under Creative Commons. See my website for details.